Oh, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Debbie Collier? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the incident, then offer my analysis. Deborah Collier was born on September 2, 1963, and lived in the state of Georgia. She went by the name Debbie. In 2022, 59-year-old Debbie lived in Athens and worked as an office manager for a real estate agency. Athens is about an hour and a half east of Atlanta. She lived with her husband, Stephen. The couple had been married for over nine years. They both had children from prior relationships. Debbie had a 36-year-old daughter named Amanda Bearden and a 33-year-old son named Jeffrey Bearden. Sometime in August of 2022, Debbie was involved in a motor vehicle collision. The driver of the other vehicle was out on parole and reportedly begged Debbie not to call the police. Apparently, the other driver wasn't supposed to be driving on parole. While her vehicle was being repaired, Debbie was driving a rental vehicle, specifically a black 2022 Chrysler Pacifica SUV. On September 8, Amanda, again, this is Debbie's daughter, and Amanda's boyfriend, Andrew Gigerich, moved into Debbie's house. Amanda had been living with her brother, Jeffrey, in Maryland. Both Amanda and Andrew had a history of entanglements with law enforcement. Amanda had been arrested for battery and falsifying a drug test. She accused her boyfriend, Andrew, of breaking into their home during an incident in 2021. Both Amanda and Andrew were arrested during that incident. Amanda was charged in connection with making a false report of a robbery. Andrew was charged with battery, property damage, and criminal trespass. Andrew had an extensive criminal history and at one point was an MMA fighter. Now moving to the timeline of the incident. On Friday, September 9, 2022, Debbie's husband, Stephen, saw her for the last time at around 9 p.m. When he left for work on the morning of September 10, the Chrysler Pacifica was in the driveway. Stephen and Debbie slept in separate rooms due to an excessive snoring situation. At some point after Stephen left for work, Debbie departed from her home in Athens, Georgia in her rented Chrysler Pacifica. Debbie took her purse, cell phone, driver's license, and debit card. At 2.17 p.m., her vehicle was captured on a traffic camera in Tallulah Falls, Georgia. At 2.55 p.m., Debbie was captured on video surveillance at a family dollar store in Clayton, Georgia. She was wearing a blue skirt and a University of Georgia football jersey. She purchased several items from the store, including a tarp measuring 9.5 by 7.5 feet, a reusable tote bag, a refillable torch lighter, a rain poncho, and a two-roll pack of paper towels. She walked out of the store at 3.09 p.m. and remained in her vehicle until 3.19 p.m. While she was in her vehicle in the family dollar store parking lot, Debbie sent her daughter, Amanda, $2,385 using the app Venmo. Debbie also sent her a message that read, They are not going to let me go. Love you. There is a key to the house in the blue flower pot by the door. Debbie then drove south on Georgia State Route 115. On the same day, at around 6 p.m., Debbie was reported missing by her husband and her daughter. On September 11, the police tracked the Sirius XM signal from Debbie's rented SUV to Tallulah Falls, Georgia, and found the vehicle at 12.44 p.m. The SUV was parked at the entrance of an old logging road about 60 miles north of Debbie's home. The police searched the area and found Debbie's body in a ravine about a quarter of a mile away from her vehicle. She was naked on her back and holding a tree branch in her right hand. She had second and third degree burns to 80% of her body. The tarp and the bag that she had purchased at the family dollar store were next to her body along with her purse and cell phone. The police also found a melted gas can. The police believe that Debbie was the victim of a homicide. 
They did not think the homicide was random. Rather, Debbie was targeted. On November 17, 2022, the coroner concluded that Debbie had brought an end to her own life. So the murder theory was out the window at this point. Her cause of death was inhalation of superheated gases, thermal injuries, and hydrocodone intoxication. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one, a neighbor of Debbie Collier reported that in the days leading up to Debbie's disappearance, a young woman had been coming by the house. Perhaps the neighbor was referring to Amanda. This is not a surprising report considering that Amanda moved into the house on September 8. What's more worrisome is that the neighbor reported hearing screaming and fighting on the evening of September 9. Item number two, whenever a wife dies under suspicious circumstances, the police are always going to take a close look at her spouse. When Debbie's husband, Stephen, reported her missing, he said that her purse was still in the house, but Debbie's purse was found near her body. It's not clear why there is a discrepancy about the purse. Maybe Debbie had more than one purse, which caused confusion. Stephen was working all day on September 10. He was parking cars at a sporting event. His alibi was confirmed by the police. Item number three, Amanda said that her mother, Debbie, was acting strangely not long before the disappearance. For example, Debbie gave Amanda some of her possessions, shared intimate information, and had taken the entire week off from work. Debbie had tears in her eyes during her last encounter with her daughter. Again, this is according to Amanda. Item number four, it doesn't make any sense that Debbie would have purchased the tarp and the reusable bag in Clayton, Georgia. There were several tarps and reusable bags in her home, according to her son, Jeffrey. Perhaps Debbie had not solidified her plan before departing her home in Athens, Georgia. Item number five, the timing of Debbie's disappearance and death is curious. Debbie had just turned 59 on September 2. Her body was found on September 11, but presumably she had died on September 10 eight days after her birthday. In addition, Debbie's death occurred just two days after Amanda and Andrew moved into her house. Perhaps the stress of their unruly behavior was a contributing factor, like it was simply too much drama for Debbie to cope with. Item number six, it appears as though the police initially viewed Amanda as a potential suspect. They interviewed her and demanded a DNA sample. A few circumstances came together that attracted attention to Amanda. Amanda had an extensive criminal history, as did her boyfriend, Andrew. Her relationship with Andrew was tumultuous and characterized by violence. The couple had just moved into Debbie's house, and a neighbor had reported hearing screaming and fighting. Amanda arrived at the scene where Debbie's body was found not long after the discovery was made. She was described as hysterical. Amanda was sent money by her mother right before she died. The amount of money may have been close to what Andrew owed in probation fines. Item number seven, based on some of Debbie's behavior, she may have been experiencing paranoia. Debbie drove away from her residence unexpectedly without taking supplies. She did not tell anybody where she was going. Debbie had back problems, yet still walked about a quarter of a mile into a wooded area after parking her vehicle by an old logging road. When looking at Debbie's last message to Amanda, Debbie said, they are not going to let me go. Her use of the word they has a conspiratorial feel to it, like some group was out to get her. It was like this group of evil conspirators was holding on to Debbie, exerting some type of power over her, or otherwise making her feel fearful. The use of highly destructive means like fire is not unheard of by people who are paranoid. It's a way of purging or destroying any way that they could be tracked. Similarly, paranoid people sometimes remove all their clothing to achieve the same goal. Moving to item number eight, Debbie had been prescribed the opioid hydrocodone, which was almost certainly given to her to treat pain. It's not clear what the source of the pain was, like was it her pre-existing back condition, an injury from the motor vehicle collision, or something else. Debbie had a substantial quantity of hydrocodone in her system when she died. Opioid use can lead to a number of adverse reactions, including difficulties with sleep, 
appetite, memory concentration, and nausea. One uncommon side effect of opioid use is psychosis, like hallucinations and delusions. Most hallucinations associated with opioids are visual or auditory. It's rare to see other types of hallucinations like tactile. Psychosis has a relationship with paranoia. Sometimes when people are psychotic, they are also paranoid. They think that people or other entities are out to get them. Sometimes they run away because of this paranoia, like climb into their vehicle and drive. Perhaps Debbie was paranoid due to her use of hydrocodone. This paranoia drove her to engage in unusual behavior. One problem with this theory is that the relationship between opioid use and psychosis is very weak. Opioids are generally not associated with psychosis. Maybe Debbie was one of the very few people who was predisposed to have a psychotic reaction to opioids, or maybe she had some unknown pre-existing mental health concerns that led to paranoia. Another problem with the opioid paranoia theory is that, based on how things turned out, Debbie could have taken the hydrocodone in order to achieve her ultimate goal. So she didn't take the drug and then develop paranoia, she became paranoid and then took the drug. Paranoia is a possibility in this case, although it's unclear what could have caused it. Debbie may have simply been depressed and used the word they to refer to a series of problems rather than to evil conspirators. Her other bizarre behaviors could be explained by confusion or being severely despondent. This brings me to the final item, number nine. What do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. The circumstances surrounding the death of Debbie Collier are suspicious. The police initially said that she was murdered and was specifically targeted. They then changed their minds completely and went the other way as far as their determination. Considering how she died, homicide did appear to be the most obvious explanation, but the problem was that she was captured on a surveillance camera buying items right before she died. She was alone. She did not appear to be acting erratically. She didn't look like she was frightened. And right after making the purchase, she sent her daughter money, as well as a message that contained an implication of finality. There is no reason to believe that anyone had contact with Debbie after she left the family dollar store. Debbie appeared to be making her own decisions and deliberately moving toward a particular goal. I don't think that Amanda and Andrew were sophisticated enough to get away with homicide under those circumstances. They had a history of mostly petty crimes, which were based on impulsivity. This couple was less like Bonnie and Clyde, and more like Itchy and Scratchy from The Simpsons. I think it is reasonable to believe that, despite the mechanism of death involving unusual features like fire and hydrocodone, Debbie was responsible for what happened. In her last actions, Debbie did not do her daughter any favors. She actually made Amanda look like a pretty good potential suspect, but I imagine that this was far from Debbie's mind. I don't think she was trying to frame her daughter. Debbie was focused on one objective only and highly motivated to achieve it. Those are my thoughts on the case of Deborah Collier. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.